Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A uh, little sound check. Can you hear me okay in the back there? Perfect. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone, to the third installment of our 2024 Spring Lecture Series. I'm so thrilled to see so many of you here on this rainy Tuesday evening. Um, welcome to the Frontier Culture Museum. Um, we're so glad to have you. Uh, we do have programs and survey at the back, cookies and water. Please help yourself. Please fill out the survey. Let us know how we did. We really take your feedback to heart, and we try to continue developing programs that really um, interest you. Um, so without further ado, it is my great, my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. Carol Nash is a professor in the School of Integrated Sciences at James Madison University, where she has taught for 35 years. Her research focuses on the Blue Ridge and Shenandoah Valley, specializing in First Peoples archaeology and historical ecology. She's the author of many technical reports, scholarly papers, and publications, including co-author of Foundation of Archaeology in the Mid Middle Atlantic. She's president of Mountain Valley Archaeology, which partners with descendant communities on archaeolo archaeological and historical research in Western Virginia. She directs the Virginia Archaeological Certification Program, a citizen science initiative that partners professional and avocational archaeologists. And she's also been an incredible friend of the Frontier Culture Museum and for many years, and she continues to advise us on a number of very important issues. So we are so fortunate to have Carol based here in our area, and I'm delighted to welcome Carol to the Frontier Culture Museum this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you all being here this evening. It's great to see you. Um, and I will have to say how grateful we all are for the rain, uh, because there's still some fires that need to be fully extinguished. Um, I have to say also, before I begin tonight, that as I put the talk together, of course, uh, you, some of you who have heard me speak before will recognize a little bit of this. But it gave me the opportunity to think more broadly and to think about some new ideas that I had not put together yet. And so I'm going to try them out on you tonight. So um, this is part of the series looking at local to national. And the goal of my talk this evening is to introduce to you the idea of just how local, national, and global the Shenandoah Valley was as early as the 17th century. And we're going to get into a long, uh, well not long, we're going to get into a, um, a, a travelogue, so to speak, through the region as a way to tell the story that I'm often asked, what happened to the native people? Why are there no indigenous communities that we recognize in Western Virginia today? Well, we'll answer that question along the way. But I also have phrased this in such a way to challenge us to think about why we need to find the stories of these people, why we need to tell their stories, and what it means that they have been invisible, even though, spoiler alert, they were here, and they are here. And so that's our talk for this evening. So first to begin, we do acknowledge that the uh, Virginia Uplands is the ancestral Yesa home, Yesa the people, uh, in the Saponi language, which is, um, represents the Eastern Siouan language family of all the people who lived in this part of Virginia, the Monacan primarily, the Manahoac, the Tutelo, the Saponi, the Monitan in West Virginia. And this is a map that has been created at Virginia Tech with input from the tribes to get across the idea that there was across this entire region and there remain pockets across this entire region of people who are associated, affiliated with Eastern Siouan languages. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in, um, uh, in a bit. But we also express our gratitude for their stewardship of lands and waterways over many generations and commit ourselves to meaningful engagement that makes visible their history and honors their future. 
So we begin tonight by me putting myself in my place. I am not indigenous and I do not speak for indigenous people. And that's a very important thing for me to say. I think often somebody comes to talk to you with a title doctor uh, and from a university and there is the assumption that somehow they have the corner on knowledge. And the fact of the matter is I'm a storyteller I use certain types of evidence and certain types of information to put stories together, but because I am not indigenous, the stories that I have to tell are coming from a particular perspective. And so the more that I do this work and partner with indigenous communities, the richer this story becomes. So I think it's important for me to say that this evening. These are the people who speak. These are the chiefs of the 11 Virginia tribes. From left to right, Chief Steve Atkins of the Chickahominy, Chief Ann Richardson of the Rappahannock, Chief Keith, Rich Keith Anderson, excuse me, he would like it if I called him Keith Richards, Keith Anderson of the Nansamon, Chief Robert Gray of the Pamunkey, Chief Diane Shields of the Monacan, Lower R uh, Row, Chief Gerald Stewart of the Eastern Division Chickahominy, Chief Frank Adams of the Upper Mattapani, Chief Mark Custolo of the Mattapani, Chief Charles Bullock of the Patawomac, Chief Lynette Alston of the Nottaway, and Chief Walt Brown of the Chirwinaka Nottaway. These are the people who really speak. And I want to show them as often as I can so that we know who they are and who they are affiliated with. Um, but I begin tonight by placing us in this valley. And this is a quote from Thomas Jefferson. And he was talking about Shenandoah Mountain, essentially. He was talking about the Blue Ridge and then the mountain to the next, called by North Mountain, is of the greatest extent, for which reason they were named by the Indians the Endless Mountains. That factors into this story very much as we go forward tonight. Um, just a little bit of geography. I'm an environmental archaeologist, and so I always have to throw in something about soil or geography or rocks. You'll see that. But tonight, I just want to remind you that where we live is really a miniature continental divide. Most people don't realize that, but the rivers to the south and west, the New River drainage, for example, and the Greenbrier, which is just over the hill into West Virginia, uh, they drain to the Gulf of Mexico. They flow up to the um, Ohio, down into the Tennessee, and then into the Mississippi, into the Gulf of Mexico, in the state of Virginia. A lot of folks don't realize that it is quicker for people who live in southwest Virginia to drive to Chicago than it is for them to drive to the eastern shore. So keep that one in mind. But then the rivers to the north and east, of course, drain to the Atlantic Ocean. You're going to see that this continental divide plays a very important role in telling you the story of the people who were here and their descendants who are here today. Also, we can't give a talk about the Shenandoah Valley without showing a map of the valley, uh, but just to remind you that essentially we are just right here in the middle of right in here, but there are other valleys up and down this great Appalachian Valley. And that is part of our story tonight as well. So we're thinking beyond our immediate area. We have plenty to say about our immediate area, but this story is cast in such a way that we're moving beyond our local region into other, other areas where there were very strong connections. So I'm going to begin tonight by talking to you about four archeological cultures that we know of uh, for the period right before the Europeans invaded in this area. And I'm going to tell you about them in sequence based on the radiocarbon dates that we have, based on our understanding of their cultures, but it's a very brief introduction. And what you will find is that prior to Europeans ever showing up in this valley, people from very different cultures were interacting with each other. And that's certainly part of this story as well. So 1,000 to 700 years ago, if we put this on the Christian calendar, AD 1000 to 1300, the late woodland Albemarle culture, named for Albemarle County, where archaeologists first identified this particular type of pottery that today, this is a beautiful replica vessel made by Vicki Ferguson of the Monacan Nation. Uh, but one of the things we know from their art, the studies of their, their sites, essentially, is that they started out in very small villages or hamlets with uh, small groupings of families along rivers, 
Uh, and it really was not until about AD 1000 that people in this area began growing corn. So corn was a very late addition to the diet in this area, and some of these villages do indeed show evidence of that. I wanna also mention that we have a lot of difficulty figuring out what is going on with the, the interactions of all of these people because so few of their sites have been excavated. Here in the Shenandoah Valley, even though we have several thousand sites that are recorded with the state of Virginia, we don't have a lot of good information from the archaeological record that really helps us put this together. However, with oral tradition, with written documents as well, the, the picture sort of emerges, I think you could say. But the Albemarle culture was found all over Western Virginia, not just up and down the valley, but over into West Virginia and, of course, over into the Piedmont. And so these are the ancestors of the Monacan people, the Monacan and the Manahoac people. Um, one of the things that they are known for are very large burial mounds. I'm not showing any images of them or the burial offerings that come from them. They are very sacred places. But what you will notice is the locations of these burial mounds and when they were finished in their fullest extent, they held at approximately well, it's estimated somewhere between 1,200 and 1,800 people. Uh, and these mounds were 12 to 15 feet high and 180 feet in diameter. Big, big burial mounds. They're called accretional because they built over time. As people living in groupings of villages would pass, they would be buried in place, and then at an appointed time, they would be exhumed, and everyone from that entire community, all of the villages surrounding the mound, would be brought together and buried together. So it's a statement of unity, and it is a practice that is really just known here in uh, Western Virginia. It's not widely practiced, but we do see it as a very important Siouan tradition, Eastern Siouan tradition. So again, ancestors of the Monacan people. The burial mound offerings, and this is one thing I want to emphasize, came from as far away as the Western Great Lakes and the Gulf Coast. These folks had extensive trade networks. Copper from Minnesota. Shells from the Gulf of Mexico. Shells coming in from the coastal plain of Virginia. Things coming up from the Tennessee Valley. And so this is something that was well in place several hundred years before the Europeans showed up. So these trading networks give you a strong sense of the fact that these people were not isolated in this place. They were connected. And it's a really fascinating story to talk with the Monacan and the Saponi today about their, the stories from their cultures about these connections because they do have some stories about these connections that go way back in time. This, there was a change in the valley though. The archeology span is showing us that around 750 to 550 years ago, there was a different culture that showed up here, living in coexistence with the Albemarle culture. And this, we call it the Page culture. It's named for Page County, where some of the first sites were excavated by archeologists. So you'll notice that these are not um, named after native people themselves. Archaeologists used to have a tradition of naming things in the way they wanted to. Uh, and uh, that's not something that we w do today, but in the past, yes. But these are people who had larger populations. They lived in nucleated villages, and they were pretty interested in growing corn. And so you can imagine that these villages are, are quite extensive in size. Um, the thing that is fascinating about this page culture is trying to figure out where it came from because the Albemarle culture is homegrown. These people had been in place probably for 4,000 years, the Monacan ancestors and so forth, and then all of a sudden there's something different. There's somebody new here. And based on our understanding of Middle Atlantic archaeology, it would appear that they came from southern Pennsylvania and made their way into the upper Potomac Valley and then came down the Shenandoah Valley. And these, of course, trying to figure out exactly who they are is a difficult and really interesting question, but they were here. And then something happens out west that we think affected the valley, and that is the great Mississippian state 
that emerged near St. Louis and had extensions all through the southeast into the Great Lakes region and out into the eastern uh, seaboard. Uh, the incredible Mississippian culture that built Monk's Mound, the largest human-made earthwork in North America, north of Mexico, I should say. Um, these are the people who were very well connected. And somewhere around 1,000 years ago, 12, uh, 900 years ago, they began to disperse. And the archaeological record tells us there was a serious drought in the Midwest. And these were people who were severely or, or, so, or strongly dependent upon maize. And so as they began to disperse, they started to move into different areas and began to identify, archaeologically, we begin to see different cultural traditions emerging from the Mississippian. And we think that some of them found their way here. Some of them found their way to the Shenandoah Valley because the page culture sites, which are not small, but they are dispersed, began to, they were no longer occupied, and it looks like the people who lived in them began to coalesce around villages that looked like this. This is the Kaiser culture, and I'm going to go back for just a moment. The Kaiser culture, 600 to 350 years ago, Again, the question of where they came from, the earliest dates on the upper Potomac coming down through um, the Potomac Valley and then making that cut down into the Shenandoah Valley. But completely different way of making pottery, completely different way of building villages and ultimately living in villages that had several hundred people in them. And we've excavated a number of these or parts of, of, of these. And they are individual houses, uh, and in the Siouan language, those houses are called Ati. Sometimes you'll hear them referred to as wigwam, but that is more of a Great Lakes term. Uh, for the Siouan people, these are called Ati. And so you see those individual houses, but ultimately built with uh, inside an enclosed fence or a palisade, and that's what those villages looked like. These were the villages that were occupied at the time Europeans came in to the region. And so they, folks were interacting with descendants of the Kaiser culture named for the Kaiser farm site in Page County where this culture was first recognized archeologically. So what's interesting about the Kaiser culture is that they were traders too. Um, and it would appear, for example, from our excavations at the Kaiser farm site that not only were they making lots of shell beads for trade, but they were getting shell beads from the coast because there are ribbed mussel shell beads that come from salt water that show up in the archeological deposits at these Kaiser culture sites. And so we also have evidence that they were processing extensive numbers of deer. And so surplus production of deer. So our hypothesis at this point is that there's another culture that is living at the same time, has emerged at the same time as Kaiser, called Potomac Creek, along the Potomac River in the mid-Potomac Valley. Uh, and today, that, some of those sites are in Stafford County. But the Potomac Creek culture, we believe, served as middlemen with a, between, with a trade between Western Virginia and the coast. And this would have been the time that Powhatan began to emerge with his power out in the coastal plain. So the point that I'm making is there is a lot going on. <laughs> this is a place, the Shenandoah Valley, Western Virginia at this time before the arrival of the Europeans is already a place where people are fully extended beyond the region with important connections. And they are beginning to make the kinds of connections that essentially the Europeans walked right into and took over. And that's what we're going to talk about in just a little bit. But this is one of my favorite maps that I've ever made. It's a relief map of Virginia. But what you're looking at is the, the cultural traditions at the time of European colonization. Look at those names. How many of you know those names? Probably not very many. Okay, My students will say to me on a regular basis, why didn't somebody tell me this? Right? And that's what the tribes are saying, too, today. I can tell you that for sure. But when you look at this map, what you are seeing is an area of complex politics and economics. You're looking at people whose language families are very different from each other. 
the Algonquin-speaking peoples who are out on the coast and the Siouan-speaking peoples in the interior. And then down along the southern, southern tier, people who are speaking Iroquoian or Haudenosaunee languages, the Cherokee, possibly ancestral Cherokee over here in far southwestern Virginia. This is a pretty complicated place. And the Europeans didn't get it. They did not understand that when they came to this part of North America, I don't believe. And so we start with this question of invisibility. So here I have given you all of this archaeological evidence to demonstrate that we know they were here. We know they were here. And so where does this story of invisibility come from? It has deep roots. So we begin with one of the most apocryphal stories that I could possibly tell you. It, is, it comes from John Smith. In 1608, when Smith was roaming around the Chesapeake Bay region and doing reconnaissance, trying to figure out where it was safe to interact with native people, where they could make allies, and essentially where he could set up other military forts, his map, which is actually not that bad in places in terms of its accuracy, his map recorded two people, two cultures, and multiple villages in western Virginia right up against the base of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And those are the Manahoac in the headwaters of the Rappahannock and the Monacan in the headwaters of the James River. Okay, So this is what things were looking like on his map. And indeed, we have taken this map and have gone in the field and have been able to find what we think might be some of these village sites. It's accurate enough so that it gets you in the, uh, in the ballpark, so to speak. He did not come west of the falls. So we don't know where he was getting his reconnaissance. We don't know where his information was coming from. But as he was traveling, he was taking with him people from the Pamunkey, people from the Mattapani, people from the Chickahominy. And so they very clearly knew their way around and had made connections into Western Virginia. But here's the apocryphal story. There's a skirmish at the falls near Falmouth in Fredericksburg. And the English capture a native person, they capture a Manahoac warrior named Amoralek, and Amoralek was taken to their ship and questioned. And the question that was asked of him to start with was, do you know who we are? This is what John Smith said, do you know who we are? And his answer, we heard you were a people come from under the world to take our world from us. When I, it's, I chills every time I speak those words, absolute chills. Then we asked him what was beyond the mountains, and he answered the sun. That's where my title comes from for this evening. But if anything else, he knew nothing because the words were not burnt. And that is a reference to their hunting technique. That is a reference to something that has been pretty well documented historically, and that is that animals were driven with fire, uh, particularly deer. And so he says, of, not, of anything else, he knew nothing because the woods were not burnt. I've often wondered if he's telling the truth there, if he really did know what was beyond the mountains into the Shenandoah Valley, and was he trying to protect? I don't know. But I do find it very interesting that clearly we know there is interaction across the mountains, and, but he says he knows not who else is over there. So there's that story. And thus begins the tale of invisibility. Smith took that and ran with it. Because Smith said, oh, <laughs> there's land and resources and not a whole lot of people to deal with. And so Western Virginia was always in the sights of uh, the colonists, always in the sights of the colonial administration. So it didn't take long before a number of folks in the colonial administration and well-positioned well people began to set up trading networks and trade forts, trading forts. Uh, along the falls of the rivers. And the most famous one was Abraham Wood, who set up at Petersburg on the Appomattox River, a place called Fort Henry. And this was one of the most important forts in the eastern United States for a very long time because it is from Fort Henry that you see people who are, whoops, sorry, you're, you see people who are leaving and who are going out, traders who are going out into the south, going way down, and ultimately following from Petersburg out through eastern North America to the south. And so that was in the 1640s and continued on uh, through the 17th century. However, there's something else going on at the same time. Remember, we said politics beyond the region. 
We have to talk about what the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois, are up to. Iroquois is a French name that was given to them. They, they refer to themselves as the Haudenosaunee. So when you hear that word, that when you hear me say that, that's the, those are the people I'm talking about. But the Beaver or Iroquois Wars, as they are still known historically. In the 17th century, these, these skirmishes and wars were intermittent, sometimes very, very furious. But the five nations of the Haudenosaunee, the Mohawk, the Oneida, the Onondaga, the Cayuga, and the Seneca. And their, their economies became completely interdependent with the European fur trade. So when Europeans came in, one of the first things they wanted was fur. They wanted beaver pelts to begin with and also then deer hides uh, in the south. But the British and Dutch who, of course, the Dutch are coming into New York, they're coming into Delaware, they're the British out on the coast. They aligned with the Haudenosaunee. The French, on the other hand, who had come into Quebec by 1608, don't forget Samuel Champlain, he's sending people down through the Ohio Valley and they are right on the edge, right? They're not that far away. Samuel Champlain and others aligned with the Huron Wendat and the Algonquin who lived in New York State. Uh, and northern Pennsylvania. By the mid 17th century, however, beaver populations were depleted in the southern Great Lakes, and essentially by that time, the Iroquois economy was completely um, inter inter integrated with European global economies. And so they began campaigns to increase their territory. They wanted more beaver. They wanted access to hunting and trapping grounds, and the Dutch gave them guns. The Dutch provided them with guns and after, at that point in time, continuous warfare through the 17th century. So what does that have to do with the Shenandoah Valley? Well, actually a lot. So they were involved in dispersing the other First Nations as they controlled their territories. They would sometimes absorb them, but often they would just disperse them. There was a great deal of warfare and then ultimately, getting into the, toward the end of the 17th century, the Susquehannock, who lived in Pennsylvania along the Susquehanna River, so the headwaters of Delaware Bay, uh, and the Erie from the far western Great Lakes, uh, began to push back against the Haudenosaunee. And so the Haudenosaunee signed treaties in the mid-1670s after they defeated the Susquehannock, and then they took their attention west to the Ohio Valley. Okay, but, there's another part of this story. AD 1640, the Susquehannock are already feeling pressure from the Iroquois, from the Haudenosaunee, and they began looking for other places to go. So believe it or not, in West Virginia, right over the hill from us essentially, uh, upper tract West Virginia, a Susquehannock village dating to 1640. In Pendleton County as well, uh, sorry, Moorefield up in Hardy County, another, another um, Susquehannock village site there. Native people themselves were responding to pressures in a lot of ways and they were moving, they were dispersing. And that's one of the things that makes it so difficult to put this story together because by the time they were interacting with Europeans, they had moved on somewhere else or they were allied with a different group and they were over here now, no, we're over here. And it's very difficult and complex to keep up with all of this. So we piece it together with little stories. The Haudenosaunee in 1674 made the claim to the English colonial government that they had removed all the local tribes from Northern and Western Virginia. And so from that time on, whenever the colonial government was going to treaty with people who were in this region, the, and by that I'm talking about the colonial government beyond Virginia, so looking at Pennsylvania, looking at New York, they would only talk to the Haudenosaunee. So the, the question I have is, did they really remove everybody? Did they really remove everybody? Well, we've got some evidence to indicate that maybe they did not. But look at these maps. The French were incredible map makers. This is 1639. Here you are looking at these areas where the Haudenosaunee are seated, and you can see here is Virginia down here. But by 1650, look at this. There are the named Iroquois on French maps, and then look at these trails. Look at these trails by 1650. By 1669, the trails have become even more extensive going out to the west and coming down into what is today the um, upper eastern shore in Virginia. 
And so it's very clear that not only were the French very much aware of how these folks were organized, how the Haudenosaunee were organized, but where they were going to. And so when they claimed that they had removed all the local tribes, everybody said, okay, they're gone. Invisibility, invisibility. But let's think about this. Let's go back, let's go a little further, let's go south. Out of Abraham Woods Fort Henry, which we said was built in 1640 by 1671, one of the most famous colonial expeditions that has been described in this part of Virginia, Bats and Fallum, or they really are Bat and Hallam, went westward from the uh, Fort Henry through the New River and they camped with Totero Indians near present day Radford and they had Saponi guides. Those folks were still there, <laughs> okay? They were still there. However, this is one thing that gets really left out of this discussion, the Spanish. How often do we think about the Spanish in the interior? Well, De Soto was a busy guy. And so uh, in 1567, he sent one of his lieutenants, uh, Don Pardo, into all the way up into Western North Carolina to this place, which we would pronounce as Wara uh, in 1567. They built a fort at this village site, which, which was um, an ancestral Mississippian site, the Mississippian culture site, but in Western North Carolina. So this is in Burke County in the Catawba Valley. And ultimately, one of the things that has been learned from the archeology span is that even though the fort only stood for a year before it was burned, the impact of the Spanish, they withdrew, they went back to South Carolina and Florida, but the impact of the Spanish on the indigenous people was very real. And there are indeed Spanish trade goods that make their way up into Virginia. So again, a global setting, a global setting in this place. Uh, but here we go. In the interior, our famous John Letterer, he found that there were indigenous towns in 1671 in the upper James and Shenandoah Valleys. He also identified five nations, Haudenosaunee affiliated groups on the western margins. So he drew us a pretty complex political map here, but interestingly enough, these villages are still there and some of them are on John Smith's map in 1608. And they're still there, those people are still there in 1608. Um, the Treaty of Middle Plantation, the colony, the Virginia colony, bringing these folks into Williamsburg after the Anglo-Powhatan Wars had ended saying, we're tired of this, we want peace. These are called the peace treaties and what they offered of course was um, not much in relation to the land that they were given, but essentially they just said, we'll leave you alone, English, we'll leave the English alone, uh, the, your, the native people alone, native people leave us alone, we have a treaty of peace. And you'll notice that this treaty in 1677, Middle Plantation, the old name for Williamsburg, you notice that there are Monicans, there are Saponis, uh, there are people who are mentioned in these records who are very clearly from Western Virginia and they signed the treaty, they signed the peace treaty. So again, not invisible. In fact, so not invisible that when Queen Elizabeth came to Virginia in 2007 to celebrate the 400th anniversary of the founding of the Jamestown colony, she separately and specifically met with the tribes. She met with the chiefs because the English government still had a treaty relationship with them from 1677. In 2007. That is just an amazing thing to think about. So all these cool things. Um, but then we also have another story, another group of people who are moving. The Shawnee, the folks who we think of as being in the Ohio Valley, and of course they show up again during the French and Indian War. More on that in just a little bit. They're in the lower valley. They're up in the Winchester area. And it's interesting because probably showing up in the late 17th century, we've got one or two of their archeological sites that we know of. But what I find really interesting, George uh, Washington's map of the Fairfax Proprietary, 1736 to 1737, and he has in the upper uh, Shenandoah Valley going into the Potomac drainage, Shano Oldfields deserted. So he could still see the agricultural village sites at that time in 1736 and 1737. 1697, the Piscataway, who live along the southern Potomac, established a settlement in Fauquier County. Came out of that river valley because they were trying to escape the Susquehannocks, who were trying to escape the Haudenosaunee. Movement, interaction, affiliation, that's this story here 
1701, the Haudenosaunee established their neutrality. They said, enough, we're not going to get involved in these wars between the Europeans because they were really heating up. They said, we've got our own work to do and essentially began coming down what we now refer to as the Great Warrior Path or Route 11 for some um, in order to war uh, with the Cherokee, the Creek, and the Catawba, and this was largely over the deer hide trade. So they were still organized, but basically they were on the western margins, but this polarized the political geography of the North American interior, and ultimately the northern indigenous peoples were set against the southern indigenous peoples, and the Europeans were really good at reading that. They were really good at figuring out who was friends with whom and how they could make the most of it, uh, and so where we are was a highly strategic place. It was a highly strategic place. Very inst unstable though, however, and ultimately the Europeans were able to move in in the way that they did precisely because of the uh, conflict that existed between the tribes themselves. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, and then we do have another story, however, still not gone, 1707, Louis Michel, the Swiss explorer who is sent to find out whether or not he can, find, he can get land for the Massanutten settlement uh, in Page County, in the Page Valley. Uh, he drew his wonderful map and essentially identifies a native settlement right where uh, one of our last Kaiser villages is occupied. Radiocarbon dates of 1690. In 1707, people are still there. And these are people of the valley. These are people of the valley. Tuscarora moved through the valley. Uh, the migration from North Carolina after the wars with the Haudenosaunee, they had pretty much had enough and those who had survived began to move to the north and ultimately became the sixth nation of the Iroquois, became the sixth nation of the Haudenosaunee. They were invited by the Haudenosaunee to move to New York and ultimately that migration started in 1713 and was completed in the 1760s and that migration brought them right up the valley. So more stories of indigenous people uh, in this neck of the woods. In fact, this is one of the most remarkable stories. The Tutelo language, which is one of the Eastern Siouan languages, was still being spoken apparently by Nikona, who was known as the last Tutelo, and he was living on the Six Nations of the Grand River Reserve in Ontario. So it may well be that some of the indigenous people of the valley migrated along with the Tuscarora and ended up in Canada. But there's still some here, there's still some here. And so you have the Treaty of Albany and the Treaty of Lancaster. In 1722 and 1724, the Europeans are speaking to the Haudenosaunee. And they're saying to the Haudenosaunee, leave us alone east of the Blue Ridge, you can have everything to the west. And then in 1744, they say, just kidding, we want the West. <laughs> so you keep on moving, keep on moving on. But the treaties, the Treaty of Albany and the Treaty of Lancaster, the Treaty of Albany actually does mention several indigenous groups in the, from the colonial period in the valley. By the time you get to the Treaty of Lancaster, they're not mentioned at all. So according to the British, the colonial settlement according to the British could go all the way out to the Ohio Valley by 1744. According to the Haudenosaunee, the Blue Ridge was the line that they agreed to. So you see where this is leading. This is leading to them allying with the French, and this is the French and Indian War. This is one of the bases for the French and Indian War. All right, so continuing then to tell the rest of the story, um, we are looking at dispossession, we are looking at diaspora, we are looking at people who were not invited to the table to speak uh, when treaties were written, but we're also looking at some colonial policies locally that made a big difference. So for example, Governor Spotswood in 1714 did a number of things in the interior. He created what was called the Virginia Indian Company, which was going to be a trading company, and he granted them a monopoly over native trade, but they were also charged with building Fort Cristana. Fort Cristana in Brunswick County was to be the place where all the interior native people who could be found would be brought, and specifically their children brought, to be educated and ultimately Christianized. That would be part of it as well. So this was a forced community. Uh, Saponi, Tutelo, there are the names of people from villages on John Smith's map in 1608 who show up at Fort Cristana in the roles 
but historically they all get compressed into the name Saponi. And so by about 1720, it gets very difficult to find the folks who lived in West, the named communities in Western Virginia, it becomes very difficult to find them in the record because to the colonial government, they were all Saponi. And so you find that all through Spotswood's writing. That's not, uh, or sometimes referred to as the Christana uh, Indians. So this is where you get this creation of the backcountry to go to our title for this evening. And the story that I ask is who benefited from this? Who benefited from the story that there were no indigenous people in the Shenandoah Valley when the Europeans arrived? How is that story so pervasive and why has it been told for over 200 years? Well, clearly, it's not an easy story to tell because you have to pull in all of these lines of evidence to put it together. But there are other things that are going on. So obviously, our ancestors benefited from this story. When you look at the great patents that were given in the um, early and mid 18th century, the Beverly patent, for example, um, the idea was that there would be literally a buffer for the colonial power in eastern Virginia from these settlers in western Virginia, and that if anything was going on with native people, they would take care of it, but in the meantime, all this land was opened up to them. So that was part of the story. The Borden patent, another, backcountry, presented as backcountry, wilderness, nobody's there, move right in. That's your place. Make yourself at home. And so we, we see this story literally having these really profound impacts that shape land today, that shape land ownership and land use today. They really do. So this concept of backcountry is essentially a fiction. There is no backcountry. As the Monacan poet Karen Wood has always said, this land was not discovered, it was always loved. This land was not discovered, it was always loved. So in 1735, how quickly did this happen? There were 160 European families living west of the Blue Ridge. 1745 to 1755, 10,000 Europeans are here. Happened fast. And what I find most interesting about this particular story, and I have to tell you, I grew up over in Madison County. I have um, ancestors who were part of the Germana colonies, right? All of these people came from places of diaspora the Germans, the Scots-Irish. It's not as though they were unfamiliar with this idea of being forced off land and having to make your way. But one can only imagine how important it was for them to find a place so that they could get established. And I find that to be one of the great ironies of history. One of the largest refugee camps that was ever documented in Europe prior to World War II was on the outskirts of London with all the Germans who were trying to come to America. So. That's part of this story as we go forward. So here is Francis Fauquier, Governor Fauquier, who says in 1756, the Saponi live in peace among us. Oddly enough, of course, the French and Indian War had already started, but <laughs> in this area, when we talk about the native people who were affiliated with the French and Indian War, we are talking about the Shawnee who came in with French. And unfortunately, if you look at local history, you will find that they all get compressed with the stories of earlier native people. So it, it's hard to pick it all apart. So by the late 18th century, Virginia native communities were archeological. Thomas Jefferson, for example, in Notes on Virginia, wrote a little bit about Virginia tribes, but it was basically in the past, and then he spent a lot of time writing about burial mounds. He was very interested in burial mounds, and he talks about, for example, uh, there was another barrow, what, what he called them, the low grounds of the south branch of Shenandoah where it crossed by the road leading from Rockfish Gap to Stanton. That's Waynesboro. That's where the DuPont plant is in Waynesboro. <laughs> so, you know, it was known. It was known, but they were archaeological. They were of the past. They were people of the past. Churchill, his history of the valley, 1833 talks about known indigenous people in Virginia, uh, in Western Virginia, known indigenous sites in Western Virginia, but again, nobody present, nobody present. And he does, to his credit, refer to this whole thing as um, eliciting melancholy regret, but that was part of his story as well. You get into Augusta County research, and here you have the famous Chalkley Chronicles, uh, and they have their own problems. Any of you who do historical research know that there are some problems with the way they have been transcribed, but 
If you look through them, no reference to indigenous whatsoever. No reference, so again, invisibility. Then you get into the late 19th and early 20th century and there is this genre of historical writing called what I call the disappearing Indian. Uh, this is just one example from Orange County, the last Indians in Orange County. Waddell and Peyton wrote about the last Indians in Augusta County. And see, that becomes, again, part of the story. And anthropologists were guilty as well. Pro professional historians were basically doing the same thing. So here's an example from the Manahoacs. Uh, assumed the name of Tuscarora and deserted their country in Virginia. Deserted their country in Virginia. Um, a wandering people silently melted away. Silently melted away. Nothing important has been recorded. They appear to have dropped out of history extinct long ago. This has been picked up in textbooks, this has been picked up by historians, and it has been promoted over and over again. The reason why this invisibility, though, is so incredibly damaging is not because of what happened in the 16th, 17th, 18th, or even 19th centuries. It's because of what happened in the 20th century. And a lot of people are not aware of this, but we are, this month, marking the 100th anniversary of the passage of the Virginia Racial Integrity Act. The Virginia Racial Integrity Act. Walter Ashby Plecker, whose family is from Stanton, uh, was the registrar of the Bureau of Vital Statistics and he was an obstetrician. He is known for creating um, an incubator. He did a great deal of good work in his early years, but he was a eugenicist, he was a scientific racist, he believed that the race was being undermined, the white race was being undermined by mixture. And so in 1924, Virginia had the Racial Integrity Act. It was supported by every member of the General Assembly. And it was the miscegenation ban, no marriage between people of different races. Two races in Virginia, colored and white, there are no Indians. Because he believed that native people in Virginia had married into black families and vice versa, and so with the one drop rule, that made them black. No native people in Virginia. He changed birth certificates. He changed death certificates. He threatened midwives as they were um, recording the births of children. This was, this was a bad, bad person, and he was in cahoots with Dr. DeJarnet, so that's part of the story as well. Uh, but his view of Virginia's indigenous people, a vanished race, a vanished race. And uh, oddly enough, there was this thing called the Pocahontas exception because some of you are aware of the fact that there are people in Virginia who very proudly claim to be descended from Pocahontas, some of the first families. And the strange thing about that is, of course, if Pocahontas was a Native American, that would make her black under this law. And so these families didn't want to be black. So there was the Pocahontas exception, so you could have 1 64th Indian ancestry and still be considered white in Virginia, unless you were a Native American. It's madness, it's madness. We could go on for hours. I want to acknowledge the fact that I have a dear colleague here uh, tonight, Dr. Lynn Rainville, who has done a tremendous amount of research on this, uh, particularly as it affected the Monacan communities uh, as well. But again, his threats and those sorts of things. And his methods were very effective. You can look at the census data and you can see in 1930, there were 779 Native Americans in Virginia. By 1940, only 198 enumerated. 198 people enumerated as Indians in Virginia, as Native American in Virginia in 1940. So even though they didn't legally exist as a people. The Mattapanai and the Pamunkey continued to uphold the Treaty of Middle Plantation and every year, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, bring the tribute to the governor, which of course they still do today. But I think it's really amazing and one of the terrible ironies of history that even though they were not accepted for what they were, for who they were, they still continue to uphold uh, this particular treaty. The impact on the tribes was uh, devastating. As you see, Ken Adams, who at that time was chief of the Upper Mattapanai, uh, talked about the fact that people left, that families would send their children away so that they could get an education. And ultimately, what you see in Virginia is a landscape of division. You see this incredible landscape of division.
that existed until 1967 when the Supreme Court overturned the racial miscegenation or the Racial Integrity Act uh, under the Equal Protection Clause with the case Loving versus the State of Virginia, which many of you are, are aware of that particular case, um, and ruled in favor of Mildred and Richard uh, Loving, but the remainder of the Racial Integrity Act was not repealed until 1975, and the Sterilization Act that went hand in hand with the Racial Integrity Act was not uh, repealed until 1979. The Native people want this story told. They want this story told. And I'll say more about that in just a moment. But it is also the case that children in Virginia were never taught Native history. Here are these textbooks. This is my fourth grade and my seventh grade textbook in Virginia. Very, very widely used for a generation at least. Most Native Americans pushed out of Virginia by civilized settlers. They were backward than other, uh, more backward, uh, and still in the Stone Age when uh, the English came to Jamestown. So this book was used, these books were used until 1980. 1980. It wasn't until 1983 that the state of Virginia recognized formally the tribes. And some of them were not formally recognized until 2011. Some of them were not formally recognized until 2011. And I think that is really a uh, significant thing to, to point out. Most of them, as you can see, are east of the fall line. The chiefs that I introduced to, to you, the only ones to the left, to the west of the fall line, are the Monacan. And today, of course, they live in Amherst County. Uh, and more on that in just a second. So today, there are approximately 7,000 citizens of Virginia who are uh, recognized, enrolled uh, with the tribes. And you can see that's a very small number. It's less than half a percent of the Virginia population. There are more indigenous here from other places. But these are the ones who are here today. And the point that we need to make is they survived. They survived. They survived invisibility. They survived the Racial Integrity Act. And so as they often say to those of us who do this work, don't leave them with the negative. Tell them what we're doing now. Tell them what we're doing now. So for example, of the 11 tribes, seven are now federally recognized. When the Bureau of Indian Affairs came through Virginia in 1940, wanting to federally recognize the tribes, Walter Plecker said there are no Indians here. So it has taken this long for the tribes who have the oldest reservations in the United States to get federal recognition. And so seven of the 11 currently have recognition the others are working toward it in some form or fashion. It's not an easy process. It's a very onerous process to do. But as one of the things we are seeing is that now that this recognition process is underway, the way that we interact with the tribes, the way that scholars and archaeologists and folks in local communities interact with the tribes has changed and is changing for the better, I would like to say. So their focus is reclaim, tell the history, work on repairing where possible, and move forward. And so, for example, they have the Sovereign Nations of Virginia Conference every year. All of the tribes have tribal centers now. Those who are federally recognized, some are um, now running health clinics. A number of them have health clinics. Um, they are very interested in creating opportunities for the public to come to their centers and to meet them and to get to know them. So, they feel safer now. You have to understand that until fairly recently, a lot of the information and a lot of the stories were very, very carefully protected. And you can imagine why. And so as we go forward with this, we just want to mention that one of their biggest issues is education. First of all, they want us to teach a story that is much more uh, open and much more uh, in diverse. But also, they want their kids to have educations. and so. There is now the Virginia Tribal Education Consortium that creates workshops for all kids in all of the tribes, getting them to think about going to college. And that's a really important thing uh, for them. They're very interested in this. Um, some of the institutions, some of the universities now have scholarships that can be used by indigenous students. It is the, the way the regulations are written in the state of Virginia, you cannot give a scholarship based on race or ethnicity. 
So Virginia Tech gives scholarships to the indigenous children, the students from the seven federally recognized tribes based on the fact that they are sovereign nations. Pretty clever, right? Um, <laughs> W William and Mary UVA have a large enough endowment that they are now um, able to uh, cover the cost of tuition for all children from underserved uh, backgrounds. And so I don't know exactly what the cutoff number is, but many of the children from the tribes will qualify for that. So that in itself is very, very important. But boy, there are powwows now. Uh, currently, seven of the tribes have already announced their powwows for this year. If you get a chance, you need to go. Look these folks up. Go to these powwows because they want you to come and learn. These are celebrations for them. I could give you a talk on all the stuff that these folks are doing now. It's like they have come out of the starting gate and they are ready. They are ready to roll. Um, and they feel that they have really important work to do. Uh, and so you can imagine how humbled I am to be able to tell you these stories. But I do want to invite you to Mountain Valley Archaeology, which is in Mount Crawford. Um, we have a Facebook page. We are currently pretty quiet. Uh, we work a lot with the Massanutten chapter of the Archaeological Society of Virginia, but the focus of this place is to work with descendant communities. And so as we go forward, we're looking at a lot of local history uh, at this particular place, but you can like us on Facebook. And so that's where we will end it this evening. Thank you. Thank you.